This is turning what into why. The learning objectives for this presentation include understanding some common Python counterintuitive concepts, addressing selected misunderstandings across multiple other programming languages focused primarily on JavaScript, and reviewing practical steps for locating implementation documents to identify intended language functionality. All references, including replication steps and extended discussions, can be found at glasnt.com slash watt. This talk was originally designed to be interactive with the audience, so if you think you know an answer to a question, feel free to shout at your screen. Let's talk about JavaScript. In JavaScript, what is 4 plus 2? Well, it's 6. What is 4 minus 2? Well, it's obviously 2. What is 4 minus the string 2? It's 2. And so, of course, 4 plus the string 2 is 42. Let's talk about JavaScript. In JavaScript, is 1 equal to the string 1? Yes. Is 1 triple equals to the string 1? No. Let's talk about JavaScript. In JavaScript, what is an empty array plus an empty array? It's an empty string. What is an empty array plus an empty object? It's the string object object. What is an empty object plus an empty array? It's zero. What is an empty object plus an empty object? It is not a number. What? Now, some of those most more astute members of the audience will recall that the last example was from Gary Bernhardt's WAT talk, which features this duck. In that talk, he discusses, he discusses some of the eccentricities of Ruby and JavaScript, but only focuses on the WAT, literally ending each example by saying WAT. But this isn't a WAT talk. This is instead a Y talk. We're going to learn about some of these strange edge cases in programming languages and dive into why they may not be strangenesses at all, but a misunderstanding of that particular programming language's implementation details. So in this particular example, the issue here is that of an overloaded operator. Now, when looking at the negation or subtraction, it's implicit that you can only subtract numbers. So there's an implicit coercion of the string 2 into a numeric type 2. But the plus operator in JavaScript is overloaded. It could either be addition of two numbers or concatenation of two strings. In this example, this is one of the more interesting uh, backwards compatibility issues of JavaScript. Double equals will explicitly coerce the types to be of the same type. But triple equals was explicitly added because of issues with the previous type. Triple equals in JavaScript will not do any type coercion and so should be used when you're trying to compare equality across different objects in JavaScript. As for this example, we're going to need to dive into a little bit more because this operator, the plus operator, is a little bit more complicated than what I explained. To the specifications! ECMA 2.6.2, 12th edition, the ECMAScript Registered Trademark 2021 Language Specification has a section 13.8.1, the addition operator. Note, the addition operator either performs string concatenation or numeric addition. Well, that makes sense. That's the behavior we saw earlier. But how it works out whether to perform concatenation or numeric addition is complicated. The standard defines exactly what should happen, and I've pulled out all this from the standard and put it onto one slide for you. Consider A and B. First, convert both A and B to primitives. That is, when checking the type of the value, it's one of either undefined, null, boolean, number, or string. To do this, first try the value of, otherwise cast it to a string with the toString function. If either A or B are a string, then concatenate the two together after casting them both to strings. Otherwise, 
add them together after casting them both to a number. You can now start to see where we had issues. Let's step through one of the examples here, the concatenation of an empty array and an empty object. First, we need to convert the empty array to a primitive. So the value of an empty array is an empty array, and that's an object. So we instead need to cast it to a string. In this case, it's an empty string, which sort of makes sense. In a lot of programming languages, a list of characters is a string. So if you have an empty array, it's an empty string. And of course, an empty string is a string type. So now we have the A side. We know that an empty array is in its primitive type an empty string. So we have to now deal with our empty object. First, the value of an empty object is an object. So then we need to cast it to a string, which gives us the string object object. And this is a little bit counterintuitive in and of itself. In JavaScript, the default stringy representation of an object is to declare that, yes, I am an object. A lot of programming languages will have printed representations of the contents of dictionaries or objects that are more useful, but not so in JavaScript. If you want to get the stringy representation without altering the functionality of objects or doing any polyfills or extending the language in any way, you can use json.stringify, which will give you an output that you would expect if you have dealt with another programming languages that uses stringy object, object re representation. So we know that the string representation of an empty object is the string object object, and that itself is a string. So now we have the primitive types of both sides of our equation. And since at least one of these is a string, we cast them to strings and concatenate them, which is the string object object, because if you concatenate an empty string to anything, you get the other side. So now that we have the primitive types for both our empty array and our empty object, we can walk through the different permutations we saw before. Adding together two empty arrays is the same as adding together two empty strings, which is an empty string. Adding together an empty array and an empty object is the concatenation we walked through previously, which is the string object object. And this example, adding together an empty object and an empty array is where we get interesting because this is an empty code block. The JavaScript terminal interface thinks that that's an empty function and completely ignores it. And so the rest of the operation here is a unary addition casting this value to an integer. And so if you try to cast this to an integer, the primitive type of which is an empty string, you end up getting zero. Same again for when you try to add together two empty objects. The first part is ignored. The second part tries to cast the string object object to a number, which will fail because object object is not a number. Therefore, adding together two empty arrays is an empty string. Adding together an empty array and an empty object is the string object object. Adding together an empty object and an empty array is zero. And adding together two empty objects is not a number. Ta-da! Except that's not completely accurate, is it? In this particular example, we have interesting functionality happening because of that interpretation of an empty code block. So what we should be doing is using variables because we're having some interesting times with our IO interpretation based on where we're actually running this code. So if instead we were to declare the variables A and B as being these two types and step through the operations, you end up getting A and B equal to being the same as B and A, which is really useful because that's commutivity. Same forwards as backwards. You would expect that four plus two is the same as two plus four. This understanding of but addition in math should be straightforward is where some of that what creeped in. JavaScript isn't awful. It's awful. It's full of awe. It's a nearly 26 year old programming language that is 100% backwards compatible. JavaScript written in 1995 will still work today in modern browsers. 
JavaScript won the browser language wars, defeating such foes as Flask, sorry, Flash, Visual Basic, JScript, and ActiveScript. However, if you don't understand the design constraints and considerations, you may think of these WATs as weird little edge cases. So that's okay, don't use JavaScript. There are so many other languages that you can use in the browser. You can use JavaScript, or you could use any other language and compile that down into JavaScript. And you have a few options here. In all seriousness, you can take literally any other language and there's probably a package or a program that will compile it down into JavaScript for you. That'll solve all your problems, right? Well, no, using another language won't save you. So let's talk about some more WATs. As a note again, all the examples I'm showing can be, can be reproduced using the code samples at the URL on the slide, glasnt.com slash w-a-t, WAT. Let's talk about Ruby. In Ruby, what is not true, double and false? It's true. What is not true and false? It's false. This is because the operator order of precedence in Ruby has negation in the middle of the bitwise and logical operators, which means that if you mix in some negation and mix up your bitwise and logical operators, you can get some interesting order of precedence happening. The way to avoid this is to avoid mixing bitwise and logical operators. I know Ruby looks really cool when you get to have your double ands and your double nots using your bitwise operators, but maybe keep bitwise operators to when you need to do bitwise operations. Let's talk about Python. In Python, if I declare A as 256 and B as 256, is A B? Yes. In Python, if I declare A as 257 and B as 257, is A B? No, but if I declare them on the same line and check, they are. Let's talk about Python. When you load Python in your terminal, you're probably going to be loading C Python. An optimization of C Python is to create a list of integers from negative 5 to 256 for you as an integer cache. When you assign a variable, it can use a, an integer from the cache that it prepared earlier. So when you declare A as 256, it points to the space in memory that has the value 256 that is prepared earlier. Same for B, it will point B to that same value. And so when you ask is a b, is is an identity operator. Are these two variables the same object? In this case, they are because they're pointing to the same part of memory. And so this operation is true. However, if you were to do the same functionality again, but have a being outside this cache, it declares a new space in memory for the value of a. And again, when you declare B, it will store the value of this thing outside of its cache in B. And so when you check whether these are the same object, they're not. And so you get false. However, if you were to declare the same two values on the same line, CPython will optimize that and go, oh, these are two of the same value. I'll store those both in the same place. And so whether you check whether these two variables are pointing to the same object in memory, it's true. The way to avoid this in Python is to use double equals for equality when you mean to compare the values of two objects and not the identity of two objects. Let's talk about Python. In Python, if I declare a variable s as being the string hello, and then I ask for the reverse of that, then I get the string OLA. And this is a, uh, a nice little trick in Python where you can say, I want all the bits of this string and I want to step through them in the reverse order. I want to step through it backwards. Great. 
You can also do the same sort of functionality here where we have C for every C and S and so we can step through and we can get H E L L O. And so you can see how you would go O L L E H to get the reverse of that. But if I declare a variable E as being the string Australian flag koala, and I ask for the reverse of that string, I get koala the flag of Ukraine. This is because if we were to separate out all the elements of this string, we get regional locator letter A, regional locator character U, and then the koala. Flags in emoji in the Unicode standard are made up of the concatenation of the ISO 3166 two letter character code for countries. AU being Australia and UA being Ukraine. In Python, it does not implicitly have the functionality to understand when a particular ligature or grapheme of characters is one character. It sees a flag as two characters. One of the ways that you can work around this is by installing the package grapheme, which has an understanding about these groups of characters, particularly around uh, complex emoji setups. It's very good at working this out. So if you install the package and import grapheme, while the separation for the normal string type will still have them the same. If you were to build a list of graphemes from the string, it will work out that, ah, that's an Australian flag and a koala. Be careful when working with Unicode and Emoji and Python. It gets fun and interesting. Let's talk about Python 2. In Python 2, is 4 less than 2? Well, no, no, 4 is greater than 2. Yeah, Python 2 agrees with me. Great. Is 4 greater than the string 2? Well, no, that, that, what? But okay, what about the string 4? Is that greater than 2? Yes. Oh, what? Okay, let's try this again. What about 4? is less than a list of just two. True. What is going on here? Ah, what about four is less than a tuple of just two? True. Okay, let's reduce this down. Let's just work with four. Is four less than four? No. Okay. Phew. That's fine. Is four less than the string four? True. Is four less than a list of just four? True. Is four less than the list of four is less than the string four? True. Is four less than the list of four less than the string four less than a tuple of four? True. But why? To the specifications. The Python 2.7.18 specification under section 5.3 comparison says objects of different types, except different numeric types and different string types, never compare equal. Such objects are ordered consistently but arbitrarily so that sorting a heterogeneous array yields a consistent result. So that's nice, but there's a little detail in there that says C Python implementation detail. Objects of different types except numbers are ordered by their type names. If we were to use all these values from our list of different less than operations from earlier and ask for the type of each of those, we end up with an alphabetically ordered list of types. Integer, list, string, tuple. Just don't use Python 2 anymore, pretty please. Python 3 understands emoji. Don't use Python 2 anymore. If you were to do the same operation in Python 3, it explodes saying, no, stop, don't. Let's talk about Java. 
In Java, if I have an integer a is 128 and an integer b is 128, is a less than or equal to b? True. Is a greater than or equal to b? True. Okay, so a is equal to b, right? No. This is because in Java, this double equals for integer is identity. And Java also has an integer cache, but this time going from negative 127 to positive 127. So when we declare a value outside of that cache, we get the same sort of issues we were seeing in the Python cache. The way to fix this is if you're working with the complex integer type, use dot equals, or drop down to the simple int type and keep with your double equals. All languages have quirks, but if you have a deep understanding of how a language works, it's not a quirk, it's how the language works. Let's talk about Perl. In Perl, if I have this statement, if the string A is equal to the string B, print true, otherwise print false. Will this print true or false? It prints true, but A isn't equal to B, right? Well, the double equals in Perl is numeric equality, and this will explicitly cast both sides of the equation into an integer or a number, I should say, before doing any checks on it. And so if you were to print out the result of the integer casting of the string A, you would get zero and zero is equal to zero, therefore this prints true. What you should be using in Perl is using the correct type of equality checking depending on the types you're using. For strings, it's EQ, for numbers, it's double equals. Let's talk about bash. In bash, what is the printed result of four plus two? It is four plus two. That's exactly what we asked for, right? Well, no. I wanted to check, well, what is 4 plus 2? Ah, but it's bash. I can just wrap that in parentheses, right? That's how bash works. Well, no, then I get a command not found error. Oh, I know. I have to put the dollar sign in front of it so I make sure that I actually ask for the result of this, right? Well, no, I get the same error. How about I just wrap more parentheses around it? That'll work, right? Yay, it does. I finally get 6. Bash lets you do arithmetic expansion and evaluation, but you need to do that expansion in line with how Bash interprets these more complex things because Bash is a command line. It can do math, it can do variable stuff, but it's also a complex command line interpreter. It can do all your system operations and, all, and run all your packages and stuff. It can do variable math. That's neat. Just make sure you're calling it properly. Let's talk about Haskell. In Haskell, if I let the variable a be 2 plus 2, what is a? It's 4. If I let the variable b be 2 plus 2, where 2 plus 2 equals 5, what is b? It's 5. This is a thing in Haskell called pattern matching, which doesn't make much sense until you understand it in the way that you could represent this in another language. This is a, one of the things that Haskell does by design. Haskell is a functional programming language, so some of the things that are unique to functional programming languages may be a little bit weird in any other language that you're used to. Here, for example, is how you would implement the, Fijin, the Fibonacci recursive algorithm in Haskell. For fib, if the input is 0, return 0. If the input is 1, return 1. Otherwise, return the recursive of the input minus 1 plus the input minus 2. In Python, you could do the exact same thing for the method fib. If the input is 0, return 0. If it's 1, return 1. Otherwise, do the recursion. And in Python 3.10, you could do something very similar to the original Haskell example of where 2 plus 2 equals 5 by matching on the case of your inputs. 
Let's talk about Pascal. In Pascal, if I have a simple program where I declare a variable x as an integer, and then I do some operations on x, and then I print out the result of x equals 42. If I compile that and run it, what will the result be? True. This is because in Pascal, colon equals is assignment, while the single equals is equality. Pascal is one of those programming languages that actually matches up to basic mathematics, where a single equals is equality. One equals one is something you learn in very early math classes, and having to learn or unlearn or relearn in programming languages that equals isn't actually an equality check in most languages means that when you hit across something like Pascal that explicitly has an assignment operator, it's kind of neat. Bear in mind that you can't run similar code like this in Python with the Walrus operator. PEP572 has been explicitly designed so you can't confuse equal and the Walrus operator for backwards compatibility reasons. Let's talk about Go. In Go, it looks like it has a similar operator as Pascal did. If I declare a function within a file where I want to print out, I want to have, let's guess that this is a sign. We'll work out whether it is later. If I have a is four and b is two, and then I want to print out maybe equality, not quite sure yet, but let's ask, let's say for now that we want to print out the result of a equals b. In my terminal, if I run this example, I get false. Okay, well that makes sense because 2 is not equal to 4. So that makes sense, right? Except that's not an operator. That's not an assignment operator. That is a shortcut. The colon equals in Go is the short variable declaration, whereas var value equals value is standard assignment. Now these might not look similar, but when you start getting into more complex examples, they are actually different. If you were to try to declare the same variable twice using the standard variable assignment, you would get an error when you try to compile and run this because you have previously declared the value. If you were to use the short version, and redeclare a value along with something new on the same line, it compiles fine. Let's talk about Elixir. In Elixir, if I want to enumerate over a range of one to five, and for each value, I want to ask for the square of that number. So itself times itself. The result of this operation will be the first five square numbers, 1, 4, 9, 16, 25. Great. If I was to do the same thing, but increase my range to be from 6 to 10 and ask for all the squares, I end up getting a string of gobbledygook. So what if we were instead to assign this value to a variable and then for each element in that variable printed out, you would get the list of squares that you would expect. So why did one example break and the other didn't? Let's try a different range. Let's just try an arbitrary range of 65 to 90. And this time, just give me the value. Don't do any squares with it. Just give me the value. I end up getting a list of the alphabet. In one of our previous examples, I described how in some programming languages, a list of characters is actually a string. Alexa was built on top of Erlang, which was created in the 80s, and strings in Erlang were represented as lists of integers where the integer value pointed to its character code in the ASCII code set. 65 in ASCII is capital A. Without telling our interpreter any differently, it's going to presume that a list of integers within a printable range is going to be a string. There are ways that you can change this in Elixir, and 
you should, in most circumstances in Elixir, you should be explicit with your IO output because if you're outside of a REPL, this issue would not have occurred because you need to be explicit when you print out. Let's talk about C++. In C++, if I have a method main where I want to print out WAT, and then I compile this and then run the compile program, I don't get WAT. I get WAT pipe. This is a little bit of a contrived example because what I actually did to compile this program was set the trigraphs flag to be on, which gave me some output saying that it converted my trigraph to a vertical line character. I came across this one while especially frustrated trying to do some print line debugging as one does. And so I threw in some millennial speak in there and then tried to process my logs by trying to find my very uniquely designed string that wouldn't otherwise be in my output. And I couldn't find it because it was being converted for me. Some of these earlier programming languages just don't understand millennial, right? But it's true to the standards. The first edition of the International Standard for Programming Language C++ in Section 2.3, Trigraph Sequences, says before any other processing takes place, each occurrence of one of the following sequence of three characters, trigraph sequences, is replaced by a single character indicated in Table 1. This will explicitly say, if I give it question mark, question mark, exclamation mark, replace it with a vertical line or a pipe character. Okay, but why? Well, earlier in the standard, there's a mention of ISO 10646, which is the specification for the universal coded character set, i.e. Unicode. However, these trigraphs in C++ are a compatibility feature to the original C language, and C comes from a time well before Unicode, and instead was originally implemented with the intention of supporting ISO 646, also known as ECMA 6. Yes, that ECMA from earlier. To the standard! I apologize for the inaccessibility of this slide. This scan is some retro goodness, and I had to include it in wholesale. What this image has is the front page of the ECMA European Computing Manufacturers Association Standard 6 7-bit input-output coded, in char coded character sets, 4th edition, which is the earliest I could find on the internet, from August 1973. This details how many characters you can get into just 7 bits of storage you can get 128 characters, which is not a lot. You can get the basic ISO Latin alphabet, both upper and lower case, the complete set of Arabic numerals, some control characters, and some very basic punctuation. But after that, there's not a lot of space for anything else. Not only that, but keyboards didn't have a lot of these characters. Uh, any more characters on them, so you couldn't even type them if you wanted to. Nowadays, I am Australian, but I use a US English keyboard, and to even type the pipe character, I have to press shift, because there is no button just for the pipe character. One of the early ways programming languages got around the issue of not being able to type characters was to interpret a series of three characters together, question mark, question mark, insert third character here, as a trigraph replacement for these certain characters, including the vertical pipe character. And of course, because we have Unicode, we have no other problems with any other character encoding, right? Oh wait, I already gave that example a couple of slides ago. Huh. No language is better than any other language. The mere fact that a programming language exists means years of work by many people building and developing a common dialect to describe and manipulate the realm in which that programming language lives. Each language has its own strengths. Let's talk about PHP. Now in PHP, they have the concept of a ternary operator. If you've not seen this before, 
whatever is on the left hand side of the question mark, if that's true, then run the left hand side of the colon, otherwise run the right hand side of the colon. So in this particular example, true is true, so it prints true. If it was false, it would print out false. That's not the word. You can chain together ternary operators in PHP. So if I was to have this chain, false one, false two, three, what do you think it's going to print out? It's going to print out three. What if I had false one, true, two, three? It's going to print out two. What if I had true, one, true, two, three? It's going to again print out two. This is because ternary expressions in PHP are left associative. There is a presumption of the order of operations here. We would presume that in our last example, because we had true, it would print out one and then the rest of the statement wouldn't ever have to fire. Except what actually happens is that question mark is stronger in the order of precedence as what you think it is. So it'll actually say, is it true? If that entire statement is true, then print out two. You should avoid chaining these in PHP, not only because it's left associative and it's weird, but also you should be using a different structure to make it obvious what you're doing in these complex operations. Let's talk about PowerShell. In PowerShell, I want to check if 36 is greater than 42, print out true, otherwise print out false. Will this print out true or false? It'll print out false. Because 36 isn't greater than 42, Katie, you're silly. So if I was to change this around, if I was to go, is 30, if 36 is less than 42, print out true, otherwise print out false. The less than operator is reserved for future use. That operator is file redirection. PowerShell is a combination compiler and interpreter. That character is familiar to those who have any Linux experience as also being file redirection. In this particular case, the outcome of that file redirection didn't return any output and the truthiness of no output is false, and so it returned false. Indeed, we can check that this operation was actually successful because there is now a file on my system called 42 with the contents 36. You should avoid using this entirely because in some circumstances it may look like that there is an incomplete implementation of the different comparison operators, but in fact, you should be using hyphen GT and hyphen LT to do comparisons, which means you don't have to remember which way the crocodile goes. I've gone through quite a number of different programming languages and shown you what could be described as a WAT in each, but if you have a deep understanding of how a language works, it's not a WAT, it's how the language works. Whenever you find yourself thinking WAT, turn it into why. Find out why things are the way they are. Understand the reasoning behind the decision. It will help you get a deeper mastery of the language and you might just learn something new along the way. Because most of these examples are ones that I've personally come across. I've been a developer for years now and in every one of these languages, when I was starting out, I used to think, I'm a Ruby dev, Python is terrible, or I'm doing Haskell now, everything that's not functional sucks. But they're tools. They're tools to manipulate data to solve problems, and each of them have its place. If you're only proficient in Python, great, but why not try your hand at something else? You might just learn something more and help deepen your understanding of your language of choice along the way. Thank you for listening. Have a great day.